most notorious and infamous jails in the country. New York City's jail, Rikers Island. And right now you're about to get an exclusive look at what really happens as we take you inside Rikers. Some correction officers say the violence so out of control they're afraid to go to work. Assaults on officers and inmates now at all time highs. And hello everyone, I'm Bill Ritter. This special report, the horrific secrets about Rikers Island, sprawling jail complex with a frightening abundance of incredibly complex issues. side investigative reporter Dan Krauth has spent months looking into these issues and what he has found is profound. Dan joins us now. Dan, good to see you. And inside Rikers, an Eyewitness News investigation, it, it, that's what it says. And I saw it and it is absolutely horrifying. Have you ever covered anything like this? Uh, in my 20 years reporting, I have not. And thank you so much for that, Bill. One of the biggest debates right now centers around solitary confinement, locking an inmate alone in a jail cell for days or sometimes even weeks at a time. The question here is, is it a form of punishment or is it fair discipline? Here's our exclusive look inside Rikers. It was like a war. Grab my neck. Come here, baby, you're mine. I could have lost my life. I honestly can't even go past the front gate. Because as soon as I hear the doors to open to for you to go into the section to start working, just the sound of the door, the, the bells ringing, the radio announcements, I break down, I break into sweats. Broke your nose. T just uh, headbutted me and uh, hit me in the nose, broke my nose. I'm scared. I'm scared to go to work. What's it like being an officer right now inside Rikers? Um, it's tough. Uh, it's mentally challenging, um, exhausting. Um, sometimes you feel like no one really has your back. The individuals that we work with definitely are a big change in terms of uh, violence and disrespect. So walk us through what happened to you over the summer. This tall man ran after me from behind, grabbed my neck, and told me, come here, baby, you're mine. He's about seven foot tall, 200 pounds, and just swung his entire body on me. And I was just, in, I was first at shock, but I was like, I, this is fight. You can't, you, this is not happening. Keep fighting. So another inmate helped protect you from another inmate? He actually got him off of me in time, but it was just the fact that it even happened. And I didn't know this man from anywhere, never been in his housing area. The thought of you going back into that jail, how does that make you feel? Uh, I have panic attacks, <laughs> even thinking about it. My guard is up, but I'm hoping I know I can't get back to the old me, but I don't want to lose sight of the old me. This is terrible right now. And you say it's getting more dangerous. Very dangerous, yeah. What happened to you? It was like a war in the housing area. I was the only one there. It was 44 inmates, 44 gang members. And you? And just me. So I'm just basically there waiting to see what's gonna happen because you can't really control that environment with one person. They started fighting. I'm there, I'm telling them to stop. I, um, I sprayed them, I, I used a chemical agent, I sprayed them. 
the door open and I, um, I got the, some of them out. While I'm in the vestibule area talking to a captain, that's when I realized I had a weapon in my hand. Immediately, I got so upset because I'm like, how am I here working? I'm by myself, there's no help. I really felt like I was alone. It's uh, beyond stressful. It's, um, it's dangerous. It's, uh, it's a lot right now. Can you tell us about what happened to you? Without any warning or being provoked, he just uh, headbutted me and uh, hit me in the nose, broke my nose. and Broke your nose? Broke my nose, yeah. So yeah, uh, that was just, there was no, we had no prior uh, issues. There was no, I, I grew up in an era where, you know, you get what you put out. Um, it was, there were no issues between us. It was just a matter of, look, you're not gonna give up this weapon now, okay? You're gonna be secured in a pen until you decide to change your mind or security will have to come in and deal with it. So what happened to the inmate? Within two weeks, I think, he was already back in our facility. So had I not been seriously injured, even though he had assaulted me, I would still have to be working with this inmate who basically faced no consequences as a result of his actions. When they know it's not there, now they act out even more. Because nothing's gonna happen to them. So what, what do you think's gonna happen? They're gonna do whatever they wanna do, right? Anyone would, if there's no laws in place. The violence in our jails has skyrocketed, and the data shows that every year steadily, the violence has risen, every single year. So we, inmates are insulting us with impunity. And when they know it's not there, now they act out even more, because nothing's gonna happen to them. So what, what do you think is gonna happen? They're gonna do whatever they wanna do, right? Anyone would. If there's no laws in place, it's gonna be chaos. The violence in our jails has skyrocketed, and the data shows that every year steadily, the violence has risen, every single year. So we, inmates are insulting us with impunity, and if there's no consequences, this behavior is just gonna continue. New Mayor Eric Adams recently spoke out in favor of punitive segregation, which caused more than half of the city council to send him this letter, claiming evidence shows solitary could lead to more violence, and they believe it's a form of torture. It is torture uh, in every sense of the word. And, you know, I think that we have values as such that we treat people with, with, with dignity. We don't do this to other human beings. To do something and that something can't be doubling down on failed strategies. What do you have to say to people who believe that this is torture, putting them in the box? Uh, it's not torture for the ones I speak to. It's not what they think it is because it's not like we're not interacting with them. They're still eating every day. They're sleeping. They get to read. Just a fascinating piece of journalism and a disturbing and profound one as well. And as Dan's reporting mentioned, it's not just officers getting assaulted. Inmates are victims as well. Inmates who are oftentimes waiting months, even years, for a trial in a backed up courthouse system in New York City. More backed up than ever, thanks to the pandemic. Plus, some high profile deaths inside the jail complex have long sparked advocates to call for better conditions. Dan has more on that angle of this complex issue. There have been vigils. Our community is literally dying to live. Rallies. We are worthy of legal aid, liberty, justice, resources, and we are worthy of life. And marches over the years, calling for improvements for inmates and for an end to solitary confinement at Rikers. Those calls intensified after the deaths of two people. 
27-year-old Aileen Polanco was arrested for assault in April of 2019. She was put into solitary and found dead in her jail cell. A medical examiner said her death was related to an epileptic seizure. After an investigation, more than a dozen officers were disciplined for not checking on her in 15-minute intervals. We need to save lives. Like, the system, the system kills so many people and enough is enough. And before that, you may have heard of the case of Khalif Browder, jailed at Rikers for three years after being accused of stealing a backpack at 16 years old. He spent a majority of that time in solitary before eventually getting released. I'm never going to get those years back. We spoke with him back then, shortly after the charges were dropped. No apology, no nothing. They just said, oh, case dismissed. Don't worry about nothing. Like, don't, what do you mean don't worry about nothing? I just took over three years of my life. Browder later took his own life. Advocates say the experiences at Rikers are partly to blame. What we're seeing now is nothing short than an acute humanitarian crisis. Tiffany Caban is a new city council member who represents the district where Rikers is located, but the facility isn't new to her. As a former public defender, she has been inside the jail numerous times and represented hundreds of inmates. We've seen a rise in violence, right? Violence that's affecting everybody involved. People who are incarcerated, corrections officers, medical staff, and we have to do something. She says that something is in solitary confinement. She toured the jail recently just before and after taking office. What was your thoughts just walking around and looking at the inmates in the facility? It's absolutely un uh, unacceptable, right? We don't treat human beings this way. And it was clear that there was just a, a really big problem with mismanagement. We are not going to torture our way to safety, right? We are putting people into solitary confinement, also known as punitive segregation, um, not just in the units that are prescribed to be that, but when I walked the, the units the last time I was there, there were other housing units that were functioning as the equivalent of solitary confinement. People who did not see the light of day for a month at a time. She believes city leaders need to pay more attention to what's causing the increase in violence, not in how to punish the people involved. I would say that we are asking the wrong question as to what do we do with, with people who are violent, which by the way, that's not the only folks that end up in solitary confinement. I spoke to somebody who was in solitary because they, for 30 days because they threw a cup of water. Um, you know, Laylene Polanco, who lots of folks know about, uh, was not in solitary confinement because of violence uh, and ultimately died, right, because of it. We have to ask, what's causing the violence? Is it because people aren't getting the care that they need? Um, is it because there's retaliation or gang tension, right? Is it because there's homophobia or transphobia? And what are we doing to address those things? What are we doing to address those things? Another profound and important piece of journalism by Dan. And Dan, congratulations on that. And it's, it's so disturbing. I want to take a quick break. And then, Dan, when we come back, I want to talk to you about everything from what's causing the spike in violence to how to house gang members. So many important issues. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Eyewitness News anchor Bill Ritter, and I'm joined by seven on your side, investigative reporter Dan Crowth. And Dan, let's get right into the issues at Rikers after watching your incredible reporting. We've known about problems at Rikers for years. There's been talk of closing it for years, but they can't, of course, because the city needs a jail. The bigger question is why is the situation getting so much more violent now? That's a very good question and a complex answer. Fights and infractions um, inside the jail have more than quadrupled over the past 10 years. And it's important to point out here that this is inmate on inmate violence, inmate on correction officer, and also the other way around, officers on inmate violence. So it's a very complex issue. I spoke with about a dozen officers over the past few months, and they all tell me that they're not sure if there's one specific reason. There's a few, and it's changed dramatically over the past five years. They say, number one, sick calls are at an all-time high. 2,300 people called out alone in the month of July. That's more than double the amount the same year before the pandemic. A lot of people are sick due to COVID. Other people have been assaulted and other people just do not want to come to work because they're working triple duty shifts. Officers also tell me that when they see a spike in violence on the streets, which we're experiencing right now in New York City, we're seeing that same spike in violence inside the jail, mm -hmm. even more so because many of these members are gang members and they're cooped up inside a small building. And also it comes down to discipline. They often give someone 
someone an infraction, a monetary fine if they catch you doing something wrong inside the jail. That means you cannot use that money for the commissary, which all inmates want to use. They say that discipline simply isn't working anymore. They also showed me, and uh, we've dug up the statistics that show there has been an increase in assaults inside the jail once punitive segregation ended for those 21 and under. The officers tell me that that's a problem area, problem demographic for people who like to fight inside the jail. And yet you have some good-hearted people with good intentions, uh, officials with the city saying, you know, we got to stop isolation, solid, solitary confinement, and punitive segregation. Yes, absolutely. We're hearing from more than two dozen city council members who signed a letter to the mayor after he spoke out in favor of punitive segregation. He's a former law enforcement official himself. More than two dozen city council members, they pleaded with Mayor Adams to reverse his stance on punitive segregation. They basically believe that this is a human rights violation, and they believe, due to those high-profile cases, which we first profiled at the beginning of the special, that it shouldn't exist anymore. They believe it's mm -hmm. torture. They're actually pressing and pushing for a new law to be introduced this year that would ban it altogether, whether you're under or over 21 or not. Now, whether those signatures on that letter will translate into votes remains to be seen. Uh, let me ask you about the gangs, because we know that the gun insanity in New York City, which is epidemic at this point, uh, we know that gangs are responsible for a large part of that. Gangs are responsible for a large part of the violence inside Rikers as well. Bill, look, I interviewed one officer. She was alone in charge of a housing unit with more than 50 members of one gang when a large fight broke out. It was her in between two groups of gang members. She ended up breaking up the fights. They opened up the jail door so she could get out, and she looked down and noticed she had a knife in her hand. Oh. She was the casualty of that gang fight. She says the city should no longer be housing entire gang units within the same housing complex, which they have been doing. I interviewed Commissioner Sherwaldi just a few months ago in the fall, who admitted, yes, they are housing gangs together. They, he admitted that it is an issue and a problem, but a complex one to solve. They said we can't just break up everyone out right away, but once an inmate is booked into the Jail, they asked them, what gang are you a part of? Because they don't want to put a member of one gang in a cell with somebody else. But the officers I spoke with, about a dozen of them said, it, the inmates should be looking out for themselves. They believe the violence would actually decrease if the inmates are mixed together because uh, there would be less problems. That's their opinion. You know, there are different, different takes on this that for sure. Let, let's give people some, some solutions, some possible solutions. Because uh, they talked about closing Rikers. It's going to take a long time to do that. It's the only real big jail, uh, jail in the city of New York for all the crimes that people are charged with. They wanted to put a, a cell, jail cells and jails in four of the five boroughs, all the boroughs except for Staten Island. People aren't going to want that. It's very hard. You know, you can hear the, the outcry from residents no matter what part of the city they live in. Why don't they just build a more humane area of incarceration and redefine, reframe what this means, what Rikers means? It sounds simple, and that's a question that a lot of people are asking, but almost everyone I speak with, when they hear about the new Rikers plan, they tell me this, they'll believe it when they see it. Mayor de Blasio, former Mayor de Blasio, came up with this plan back in 2017. Hey, we're gonna get rid of Rikers, which has been around for almost a century. It's been housing mm. inmates since I believe the 1930s. And we're going to build four new jails and four of the boroughs. But a lot of things have to happen for that plan to go in place. A plan which, by the way, he wanted to be in place by 2027. That's just five years away. Um, and he believes it'll be a safer, cleaner solution, a more humane solution to have these smaller facilities spread all about throughout New York City. Um, but one thing has to happen for that to take place. You have to have the funding. More than $8 billion, I believe, was the last quote on that you also have to have fewer inmates locked up and with the pandemic we've seen people locked up for a longer period of time because it's taking longer for people to head to trial people aren't even able to bond out of jail we know cases where people have been behind bars for a year because they didn't have five hundred dollars to, yeah. to bond out so it's a very complex issue but at the end of the day you have a lot of people in four different parts of new york city that say they don't want this in their backyard so complex. You have scratched the surface, but done a great job digging deep. And Dan Crowth, we really do appreciate all the reporting you've done, Dan. Thank, thank you, you for, very much. And Bill. thank you thank for you. the opportunity to, to debrief you on this. It's important. It's we important. Uh, this isn't the first time we have taken, of course, a deep look into what's happening at Rikers Island. Within the past six months, our reports have led to changes for inmates and for officers at the jail complex. And it's complex at the complex. We're going to have more on that right after the break. Here's a startling statistic. During the pandemic, there was a record number of correction officers who haven't shown up for work. 
Imagine that. There's also been an increase in the number of officers retiring. It is an issue that Iowa Zoos was the first to expose back in September. Our reporting helped spark changes in how the jail operates and how inmates entered the jail system in the first place. Here's our original investigation from this past fall. Inside the walls of Rikers Island, there is an increase in violence. Seven on your side investigates obtained surveillance video of one incident after another. We're not talking about just attacks amongst inmates, but assaults against corrections officers are up by 23%. We feel like we're the forgotten souls. We sat down with three officers who say they were assaulted by inmates over the past few weeks, too afraid to show their faces. I feel um, scared. A five-year veteran says he's still recovering from his injuries to his face and arm. Two inmates attacked you, yes. gang members. Yes, officer really scared to go back to work because they're out of control. Another officer says he was also jumped by two gang members. You know, he literally was choking me for what felt like forever. And a third was rushed to the hospital when he was knocked unconscious by an inmate. I'm scared to go back to the jail. I'm afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. There has been an increase in the jail population over the last year by more than 1,800 additional inmates and more than 600 fewer officers who resigned or retired which means many of them are working double and triple duty shifts. Working that many hours is having a toll on the human body. A federal independent monitor released a report in May saying the chaos and disorder inside the jail is alarming and since then has said the conditions have only gotten worse. It's affecting inmates tremendously. They're not receiving the service, the mandated services that they should be receiving. The commissioner in charge of the jail was appointed three months ago. The conditions are really rough. He says he's hiring new officers this fall. We just bumped it up to 600. 600 new officers. The union says they need 2,000 to make this work. I'm supportive of the union. I think that they have uh, raised the alarm on this in a way that is very important for the public to hear. I think the 2000 numbers made up. Staffing has been a problem. This past June, more than 1600 officers called out sick. That's more than double the amount from the June before the pandemic started. And this past July, another 2300 people didn't come to work. Working 25 plus hours, how do they expect the sick rate not to be high? Commissioner Sheraldi believes some officers are abusing the unlimited sick leave policy. He's not requiring them to see a doctor to prove they're sick. So for the ones that are abusing it, which is not everybody, but for the ones that are, they need to come back to work. Something both sides agree on, harsher penalties for inmates who commit violence and a better way of separating the gang population. I do not disagree. For the injured officers we spoke with. It's like we, our, hands are, our hands are tied backs against the wall. They say they want to go back to work, but something needs to be done now. Dan Krauth, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Less than a week after that story aired back in September, a group of lawmakers in New York asked to tour Rikers Jail. They used the words horrific, inhumane, and torturous to describe what they saw inside. And together, they held a press conference outside, calling for immediate changes to be made to improve the conditions inside Rikers. Changes were announced a short time later. I want to bring back Dan Krauth into the talk, into, to talk about those changes. And what were they, Dan? Yeah, Bill, we were there every step of the way. After our report, city leaders toured the jail, as you mentioned, and 24 hours later, the mayor used emergency orders to put a number of changes in place inside Rikers. It included five of the changes you'll see here on your screen. The city hired emergency contractors to help fix and clean the jail. They shifted some court staffing to help fill the shortage gaps. The city also implemented more accountability for staff members who weren't showing up for work people calling out in record numbers, along with expanding medical capacity inside the jail complex and speeding up the intake process, which was a big problem, to reduce overcrowding when inmates initially enter the jail complex. Even with those changes, though, officers tell me that it's not enough, that not enough is being done to improve conditions inside and that they're still experiencing these problems across the board. What happens next, Bill, with the new mayor, the new commissioner, of course, remains to be seen. So complex, the problems, so complex. Indeed, it's going to be years before everyone figures this out. Dan, thank you very much. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining us in the special Inside Rikers as we looked into the issues at New York City's most notorious prison. If you have a story you'd like us to investigate, by the way, email or call the number on your screen. And to see more about the issues inside Rikers and to check out the stories we've been investigating all year round, we invite you to head to our website or our app, abc7ny.com, and click on 7 on your side investigates. And my thanks to our tireless investigative reporter, Dan Kraut, for his remarkable reporting. Our goal, of course, is to report facts and the truth no matter where they fall. 
and we hope we've done that today. Thank you for watching. For all of us here, have a great day. My name is Five Mualam Ak and I'm the founder of the Incarcerated Nation Corps, a collective of post-incarcerated leaders that all work to end mass incarceration, more specifically alternative to incarcerations for youth. We spend about $8 billion a year incarcerating youth for crimes that aren't even crimes. These youth are our future and literally the next generation in this country. We need to end that now and raise the age of criminal responsibility.